Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing the console formerly known as Xbox Scarlet. Yep, that's right, Microsoft have officially revealed yet further details of the Xbox Series X, which, yes, that's the name of the new generation Xbox. Kind of prefer Xbox Scarlet, I think that was a really cool name. Xbox Series X, I get why they've called it that given that allegedly anywhere there are two consoles, although Microsoft in this announcement are only discussing the flagship system. First of all, let's just get it out of the way. The target performance of this machine is just beastly. Microsoft are touting this console to be capable of 4K 120 frames per second support, although they do say it can output in 8K. I suspect that that's not going to be the majority of titles though. Instead, this is going to be like, let's say, if you're watching Netflix or streaming uh, movies, that type of thing, then you've got uh, 8K output. Although, technically, games may be able to render natively at 8K, although I don't think that's going to be the vast majority of AAA titles, simply because of the processing power required for 8K resolution. Nevertheless, though, the specifications of this machine are looking beastly. Microsoft have only given a few preliminary details, not least of all that it's based on the Zen 2 microprocessor architecture, which we kind of knew anyway. They've also said that it's a next-generation RDNA-based GPU. That basically confirms it's the second generation of Nave GPUs from AMD, which is scheduled to launch next year. The rumour has it that AMD will be providing a lot more details for Nave 20, so that would be 21, 22, and 23 at CES next year. And there has certainly been a lot of uh, recent developments of Nave. We've seen it even pop up in multiple driver entries now. So we do know that uh, the GPUs are getting certainly closer to release. If you recall, uh, a couple of my sources have told me that Nave 23 is going to be, quote, the NVIDIA killer, and I also reported earlier this year that Nave second generation would support hardware ray tracing, and now AMD have confirmed that. Microsoft also have confirmed other features for the next generation Xbox, one of those being, you guessed it, hardware ray tracing. But there are a couple of other features which are going to be just as important, not least of which is variable rate shading. I would like to spend a moment discussing variable rate shading because it is a very interesting technique, particularly for a console where obviously you have fixed hardware specifications in place. Variable rate shading was really touted by NVIDIA and was a feature of the Turing architecture. Oh, and for your FYI, I also had an interview with a chap from NVIDIA on the subject of variable rate shading. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description, as he went into what it does rather extensively. I will, however, be covering it in the future a lot more regarding its usage in consoles. But for now, I want to bring to your attention that there was a patent Microsoft filed and it became public mid this year. And... On top of that, we also saw numerous development blogs from Microsoft themselves. In their own blog, they say, and I quote, VRS allows developers to selectively reduce the shading rate in areas of the frame where it won't affect visual quality, letting them gain extra performance in their games. This is really exciting because extra perf means increased frame rates and lower spec hardware being able to run the game better. Than ever before, VRS allows developers to do the opposite, using increased shading rate in only areas where it matters most, meaning even better visual quality in games. On top of that, we designed VRS to be extremely straightforward for the developers to integrate into their engines, and only a few days of dev work integrating VRS can result in large increases in performance. To summarise what this really means, imagine if you are standing on a hillside in a game. If you are looking at, let's say, a rock close by, then obviously you need that to be in really great detail because you can see it closely, you're right next to it. But just like if you are on a real hillside looking at something that's quite far away, you won't be able to see it in much detail. Now in the real world, that doesn't matter. It's not shading anything, right? But in a video game, 
that does matter because essentially if all of those resources are going into rendering an object which is so far away it's pretty much irrelevant then you are wasting those resources and it's one of the reasons that variable rate shading is so important. We saw NVIDIA really push this as a technology as I mentioned ago and if you own a Turing graphics card you can download the Asteroids demo, you can see footage of it here. Uh, we actually did a test of it once again on the channel but it was also part of the NVIDIA interview. As for ray tracing, there's been a lot of discussion about ray tracing, and of course that was another feature that was heavily pushed by NVIDIA and their Turing architecture. I also uh, discussed ray tracing in the very same interview, by the way, uh, with NVIDIA that I mentioned a moment ago. Ray tracing is not just for visuals. Ray tracing also has many other usage scenarios, including being able to enhance AI as well as audio, although I will go into that more in a future video. But for now, I want to discuss the visual side of things. It was pretty evident that DXR tier 1.1, which is an update to the DirectX ray tracing spec, was primarily designed around consoles, as we saw improvements to the efficiency of ray tracing, with technology such as Execute Indirect for ray tracing, which allows the GPU itself to generate rays. This is much more efficient, and it's still early days to how this is going to apply for consoles, because we don't know an awful lot of detail on exactly what uh, AMD have done with uh, Nave ray tracing, Although, of course, there was those patents which seem to indicate that they're going a hybrid ray tracing approach for Narve. It seems that Microsoft are going to be leveraging ray tracing in a really big way for the Xbox, and it is extremely exciting. Doubtlessly, people are going to comment on the size of the system. Despite the fact that you can stand it vertically or horizontally, it's just huge. It doesn't matter what way you physically position the system, it's still absolutely ginormous compared to, let's say, the Xbox One X. And I do get that this is going to frustrate people who have limited space or maybe have a space preserved in a, a entertainment center for the console, but the reality is that the components inside this system necessitate a good cooling system. I suspect that there's a couple of reasons for the uh, large case, and although we've not seen what the cooling system looks like inside, we can say that it's not, let's say, simple. We can say that it's probably... I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's kind of similar to the Xbox One X's vapor chamber cooling system. I suspect that there's a couple of reasons Microsoft have chosen to go with this type of design. One of which are noise levels. No one wants to hear a fan particularly a really whiny sounding fan, just go absolutely crazy the moment that the system's put under load. The second of which is that the system most likely puts out an absolute crap ton. Yes, that is a technical term of heat. So at the end of the day, there's only one option. You build a more elaborate cooling system. Now, there are a lot of specifications which have leaked online, not least of all from Windows Central. They claim that the system has a 3.5 GHz clock frequency for the Zen 2 processors, and that there are eight of them with SMT support, and that the GPU is going to be outputting around 12 teflops of performance. Unfortunately, specification details of the GPU itself, like the number of compute units, are... Well, not out there. If I had to guess, doing a bit of uh, reverse math on the 12 teflop uh, figure, we're probably going to be looking at roughly 50-ish compute units, give or take some, depending on the clock frequency of the GPU uh, itself. Honestly, this system looks to be quite monstrous slow, and it's going to be very interesting to me what the console is capable of, particularly with more open-world environments, with uh, the NVMe drive, of course, not only providing fast loading times, and in theory, anyway, more persistent game worlds, but furthermore, uh, Windows Central say that you've got 16 gigabytes of memory on the console, obviously GDDR6, and 13 gigabytes of that is allocated to games developers, so they can do whatever they want within that 13 gigabyte budget. 
Well, according to multiple reports now, as well as Microsoft themselves, the NVMe drive can also be utilized as virtual memory. In theory, anyway, this is going to mean that games are going to be more expansive, more immersive. And because of the faster CPU, much more powerful GPU, theoretically, we should also see a much greater and more interactive world as well, much better AI. It's going to be fascinating, though, just how this system stacks up against the PlayStation 5. From what the leaks are so far, anyway, it looks like the Xbox does have the hardware edge, which is kind of interesting given there have been also multiple leaks from developers that the PS5 is ahead performance-wise. Yet from the leaks we have in terms of specifications anyway, it looks like the Xbox is ahead specification-wise. Although there were also reports that the Xbox was behind in terms of its development kits, that Sony had more advanced development kits. And yet, from the announcements anyway, it looks like Microsoft aren't that far behind in terms of development kits because Phil Spencer even has a system in his home that is using as his daily driver. Also, a couple of other small things regarding the Xbox Series X. Microsoft have confirmed that you will be able to suspend and resume multiple games at once. In an interview with GameSpot, um, we have Jason Ronald uh, saying the following, Today we have the capability to, of instantly resuming the last game that you are playing. Why can't you do that, but for multiple games? Many players choose to play multiple games at the same time, and being able to instantly jump right back in where I was, those are things that we can do with the platform level to make the gaming experience better. It's really about ensuring there's less waiting and more playtime, because ultimately that's what we want to do with consoles and with the services that we have. Also, Phil Spencer has really been pushing the high refresh rate of the Xbox Series X, really emphasizing the 120 frames per second support, as well as the reduction in input latency. So when we talk about things like high refresh rate and we talk about input latency, this is all about the immersion experience gamers can create where the visuals are stunning. My ability to get into the experience is very timely, and it's great as being able to have the high I.O. speeds and load times that we're going to see, and the input and the ability for just my control and activation of a character or the game itself becomes subconscious thing and not something that I think about. End quote. Ultimately, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with frame rates in many titles. We saw, of course, a lot of uh, cinematic experiences for both the Xbox and PlayStation 4 with the last generation. And indeed, many people were getting kind of annoyed at developers using terms like cinematic experience when, when trying to describe why they made certain decisions on frame rates of 30 FPS, when obviously, at the end of the day, there were reasons behind it, and those were performance orientated. Consoles do have fixed hardware specifications, but given the next generation Xbox as well as the PlayStation have significantly, significantly faster CPUs, which definitely were impacting the frame rates of the previous generation, perhaps we can at least maintain 60 FPS. Let me know in the comments on this, but would you prefer 60 FPS and let's say 1440p? Or would you prefer 4K 30 FPS as we see in many titles today on the current generation systems? In the very near future, I'll be putting out a full analysis of the Xbox Series X and also the PlayStation 5 and what we know so far. The funny story about that is actually I asked on Twitter if people wanted me to do a Zen free analysis first or the Xbox Series X. Well, actually it was the Xbox Scarlet then versus the PlayStation 5 and narrowly the Zen free micro architecture video won out, which I'm really glad it did because a couple of days now uh, after I put that uh, tweet out, of course, Microsoft have provided a lot more detail, so it's definitely good. And I feel that we're at a pretty good stage now that I can put out a pretty competent analysis based upon all of the leaks and all of the information. Get subscribed to us here at Red Gaming Tech if you want exhaustive breakdowns of both 
next generation consoles. I'll soon be putting out a video which will be detailing the rumoured specifications of both machines and how they stack up against one another, as well as examining other technologies that both console manufacturers have revealed about their systems. For example, what variable rate shading is and how ray tracing will most likely be implemented in both next generation systems and a lot more besides. So hopefully I will see you soon. Take care of yourselves and thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.